It's July, and that means the biggest players in media coming together this week uh, for Allen & Company's annual conference in Sun Valley, Idaho. Julia Borston joins us now with another exclusive interview. Hey, Julia. Good morning again, Joe. That's right. I'm joined now by Casey Wasserman. Your group, also called Wasserman, spans <laughs> music, marketing, and sports. But you really started off with sports, and that's where we're going to start okay. today because there's been so much conversation here in Sun Valley about the future of the sports business. We heard Bob Iger talk about the importance of taking ESPN eventually direct to streaming. Where do you see the streaming business going, and do you think – uh, we'll see all of sports really just be direct con to consumer and off of linear television. Well, I mean, you are certainly seeing the slow decline of linear cable and linear television. And I think you're at the bottom of that cycle where you're going to start to head into an area where there will be a rebundling. Because, frankly, bundling is good for consumers. They know, like to know what they can get and where they can get it. And that's a real problem today with a, a sort of disintermediated environment. But in that value chain, sports is going to continue to be important because people like to watch sports live. And as a media company, once you have those rights, no one else can have them, uh, and the audience is quite predictable. So whether you rely on advertising or direct-to-consumer revenue, sports will sit at the top of the value chain. What does all of this shift mean for your business, and what do you expect to happen with the NBA rights? You represent about 15 percent of NBA players. Look, the NBA is the, is the big, uh, last big rights deal for some time, uh, that in college football playoff, uh, and I think the NBA is going to have a, a significantly expanded rights deal, maybe with new partners. Clearly, uh, the disintegration of the regional sports networks, I think, will provide more opportunity for the NBA to provide more content to its partners. And I think, you know, that's something that uh, will happen. Obviously, their deals don't end until the end of the 25 season, but that's uh, uh, an exciting future. And for us, as, as representing talent, you know, they are gross revenue participants. So as, as revenue increases and, and values increase, uh, athletes are direct beneficiaries of that. Speaking of representing talent, you do not represent actors and writers, um, but one firm that does, CAA, is reportedly in talks to, to sell a majority stake um, for about $7 billion to one of the richest men in the world, Francois Pinot. What would that kind of a deal mean for you? Well, CAA also does have sports clients. They, they do. Look, I think it's a validation of, of the value of talent in the world we're moving into, which is where authenticity and ability to connect with consumers is more and more important. And so if someone whose business is making high-end consumer goods, thinks that the most valuable use of his capital is to buy a company that represents talent, I think that's a very good indicator on the future of the value of companies who work with talent. Do you think that deal will happen? I don't know. Obviously, they've got a, uh, you, you need a buyer and a seller, and their private equity partner needs to feel comfortable it's the right time to sell a business. Another big source of conversation here uh, in Sun Valley is the writer's strike and now the actor's strike yeah. on top of it. Of course, the actors are starting uh, to pick it today. A lot of the media companies that are impacted are going to be here. That means that there's going to be more tension on sports, especially in this fall lineup. What do you think the strike means for you and your business being sort of adjacent to it, but not actually directly impacted by it? Well, let me, let me take a step back, which is it's a lose-lose. Uh, you have an opportunity to create a shared economic opportunity for a new future. Um, the talent needs to feel comfortable and rewarded and protected in that environment. And that's always, when we are in a business, our first interest. But what I'm concerned about is the hundreds of thousands of people who work in those businesses who are now out of jobs, who aren't on strike, who live in the city I live in in Los Angeles and who are suffering the economic pain of that. And that's honestly being lost in this a little bit. And we're in a world now where going to the theater or turning on TV isn't the only place to get content. Uh, and so we can't cede that opportunity to other forms of entertainment by being on strike. We need to sit down and, and the, the players need to sit down uh, with honesty and transparency and build some trust and get these things resolved as quickly as possible. Yeah, I mean, I know there is a lot of concern. It's going to drag out. Um, I thought it was interesting to see there have been a number of reports that Wasserman is nearing a deal to buy Brillstein Entertainment, which is in this uh, media and entertainment space, at a time when there are strikes and there's also a contraction in the industry overall. Why would this be a time to look at that kind of a media business? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm the same guy who bought a music business in the middle of COVID when there was no one going out of their houses. So... Look, I believe in the long-term value of talent uh, at sitting at the core of these ecosystems and the core of the value chain and the opportunity to acquire the best of any business in those categories is something we're always going to pursue regardless of what may be happening at a moment in time. 
Well, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. We'll be waiting for more news. Speaking of the music industry, <laughs> there's been so much attention on Taylor Swift's huge tour um, and also about the ticketing business in general and this question of whether or not there needs to be regulation <laughs> of the ticketing business. We, there was a testimony from Live Nation yep. and, and Congress, and there's this, this question about what's best for consumers. What's best for your clients, and how do you see this playing out? So, look, the, the, the Taylor Swift situation is truly an anomaly. I mean... We represent Coldplay and Ed Sheeran and have, are filling stadiums as we speak, uh, and, and the systems aren't crashing. It's, she is at a unique level in terms of interest and anx anxiousness for tickets. Having said that, what I am focused on for our clients is that you've got a secondary ticketing market that is unfettered and unregulated, where the people who are taking the risk on the intellectual property, be it the artist, be it the promoter, or be it the sports team, are not benefiting from that. So... Once a ticket is sold, all the revenue downstream from that ticketing is going to people who take no risk. And I don't think that's the appropriate allocation of compensation. And I do think that the other piece of it is people need to know who their fans are. They need to know who are those in those buildings because those are their customers. So it's an environment where you go to an arena today uh, and Taylor Swift doesn't know who's in that building because she doesn't know where they got their tickets and she doesn't know what they got. They paid for their tickets and she's not benefiting from what they paid for their tickets. So that's where I'm think the, the focus ought to be, not on did Ticketmaster systems crash. That, that is a truly complicated issue. Um, we need to be focusing on how can we capture more of the economics from the secondary market and the data from the secondary market to benefit those who are actually taking the risk.